and a very warm welcome to Policy Watch, our weekly show that keeps you abreast of all the major macroeconomic developments of the week. As always, we have three important stories for you. We'll start our show with some of the key macro numbers that were released during the week and the IMF's latest world economic outlook. We then move on to the Bharti Walmart divorce. And finally, we close with the nomination of Janet Yellen as the head of the US Federal Reserve, the first woman to be nominated in the Fed's history. And to discuss these stories and more today is Subir Gokaran, Director of Research, Brookings India, and former Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Welcome to the show, Subir. Thank you, Matali. On the macroeconomic front, the week brought a mixed bag. Trade numbers were distinctly better, IIP numbers distinctly worse. But it was the IMF's sharply lower projection for GDP growth this fiscal that cast its shadow over everything else, especially since the fund's world economic outlook carries a thinly veiled warning that our troubles may not be over. U.S. monetary policy shocks, it says, have a significant effect on global economic activity. The fund estimates that a surprise 100 basis points increase in U.S. interest rates typically results in a contraction in industrial production in other countries by about 0.7% after eight months, compared with a 1.7% decline in the U.S. Given that the rise in the U.S. interest rates is very much on the cards, whenever the Fed tapers its bond-buying program, what does this mean for India? We'll ask Subir for his insights, but first, a bureau report on the world economic outlook. Recent remarks emanating from the government suggested that it was committed to bringing the economy to a 8 to 9 percent growth rate. But the International Monetary Fund is suggesting that may just not happen. The International Monetary Fund's World Economic Outlook cut India's growth projection to 3.8% at market prices for 2013. That's about 4.25% in Indian estimates, which are calculated at factor cost. And according to the outlook, any more potential improvement in growth cannot get extraordinarily better. Let's take a look at its reasoning. In a synchronized response to the global financial crisis, world's economies have been moving in tandem since 2010. But now they have more or less fallen back to charting their own individual paths, reverting to what the IMF calls normal multi-speed global economy. There is, however, one crucial difference. In the pre-crisis era, the emerging economies were growing faster than the advanced economies. That gap has now shrunk. In fact, the developed economies are all set to see a recovery. With the result that the US is considering tapering of stimulus, reports of which set off corrections in Indian markets and triggered the fall of the rupee. Also, the weakening of the movements of other nations does not preclude the possibility of external shocks to India. Given the financial linkages, any change that takes place in a financial hub like the United States has its effect on production in India. While increased uncertainty, global panic and changed investor perceptions complete the recipe for more disaster. But that does not mean that India has to be overly worried either, for after all, economic shocks from any nation can only affect it to the extent of the strength of its trade linkages with it. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Subir, so what do you make of the mixed bag of macroeconomic numbers that we've seen? Trade data distinctly better, IIP distinctly worse, the rupee seeming to strengthen, and then of course we have the IMF report saying that nothing is really better, in fact, maybe worse. So what do you make of all this? Are we recovering? Are we not? I think it, it actually captures the, the situation quite well. It is extremely mixed. Uh, there is some semblance of stability that has re-entered global capital markets because of the Fed's decision to postpone the tapering. Uh, which is now probably going to be offset by concerns about its inability to uh, raise the debt ceiling. That deadline is uh, on for uh, this week. And uh, that is an unprecedented situation. The U.S. has never uh, got to a point where it could be risking default. But they, I think there are some reports that some kind of compromise is yes, on the cards. Uh, so that, that is reassuring and will certainly influence, influence mm. markets over the uh, few days mm. uh, in, uh, in the early days of next week. But, you know, we don't know how this is going to impact markets. We don't know how investors are going to react to it if it were to happen. We saw what happened when the uh, U.S. sovereign rating was downgraded. Uh, it, it led to an enormous, uh, you know, uh, instability in markets for, for several days. And perhaps that is a precedent for what might happen now. On the other hand, the stability that has come from the Fed's decision to, uh, to postpone tapering, it not, not, uh, not uh, do away with it, but to postpone it, has brought some stability to uh, currency markets and through that to equity markets. So at least in India and other emerging markets, we're seeing a stability that we've not seen for the last uh, four or five months. So I think on the short term side, uh, we're really in for some kind of stability 
once we get over the debt ceiling hump. Uh, but in terms of uh, the longer term, the real economy drivers, uh, industrial production, exports and so on, it's a very mixed bag. Uh, India has benefited, I think, from the sharp depreciation because exports will respond to it sooner or later. The US is, notwithstanding the government shutdown, in some sort of recovery mode. And that is helping Indian exports to, to do better. So the Indian exports have now, I think, become much more competitive. Uh, and they will be able to take greater advantage of the US uh, recovery. But uh, domestic economy is in, in uh, still in a state of uh, what sluggishness. What does one make of the IIP numbers? Because last month we saw it go up by 2.6. This month we're kind of seeing 0.6. And capital goods in particular, last time we saw a substantial improvement, 15.6. And this time it's down by minus yeah. 2%. Capital so goods has been very, very volatile for, for the last four or five years. So I don't think we should, we should uh, read too much into the month-by-month -month variation. But to me, the you know, 2, 0, uh, little bit of negative, all of them basically indicate extreme uh, sluggishness in the economy. I wouldn't read too much into the, that range, so okay. because the, the data is so prone to uh, to sort of delayed reporting. Many sectors, the lags are quite strong. So when everything is is flat, mm -hmm. uh, these one or two data problems, okay. uh, you know, tend to generate a lot of volatility. When everything is going very well, they tend to get neutralized by you know the momentum in other sectors. So I would uh, not read too much into the Two plus two okay. minus the month one to month range. Variations. Month to month variations. But I don't overall, think. But do you I think buy the, the, the judgment is very clear that okay. th there is no clear, no sign of of uh, change in momentum at this okay. point. Is my would so be. So do reading. you buy the WO's outlook that it's going to be a pretty bad year for India? I mean, they've really yeah. down downrated the kind of. Uh, growth uh, estimate. Yes, as your report said, uh, the 3.8 number on uh, for GDP at market, market prices price. translates into a 4.25 number for GDP at factor cost. That's for calendar 2013. If you bring in the fourth quarter mm -hmm. of 13-14 and drop the fourth, first quarter or the fourth quarter of 12-13, you might go up to 4.5, 4.6. That's still and pretty that's, low. It's low, but it's now almost becoming the consensus, apart from uh, government agencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, everybody in the private sector that I've seen, including multilaterals, are looking at somewhere around a 4.5 uh, average. So, you know, between the, okay. there's a low of 3.7, but typically around 4.6, 4.7, between 4.2 and 4.7, I think, is where the ranges lie. Mm -hmm. So, this is not inconsistent with the okay, with current that. view. Except that everybody says the second half is going to be much better. You're not so optimistic on that. I think the, the prospects of agriculture clearly are okay. suggesting uh, when the Kharif crop mm -hmm. comes in, uh, you know, this will give some buoyancy to, okay. uh, to the third quarter numbers. Uh, but industry, as we're seeing, you know, uh, the month-to-month -month variation does yeah. suggest a flatness there. Okay. And the IMF report also has some worrying kind of, you know, comments. They say that, look, as far as the crisis is over, the financial crisis, the financial sector in the West is still not fully reformed and linkages are so strong. So it's almost as if they're saying that, watch out, there may be another crisis coming on. Do you yeah. kind of, what is your view uh, on that? Well, I think the, the two aspects. Of it. One is that uh, when economies are battered, mm. uh, every shock uh, causes more damage. Okay. It's like when you're ill, you know, you're recovering from one infection, That's you right. get another one. You, it could really set you back very, uh, very severely. So we're seeing a situation where the advanced economies are very, very gradual recovery mode. The emerging economies did very well for a couple of years after the crisis, but are all showing signs of, of distress uh, for different reasons. And the combination is such that any shock uh, basically could set the whole thing back. And there isn't much room for policy response. I think the key uh, you know, difference between today and five years ago, okay. that five years ago, every economy had the capacity to launch a massive okay. fiscal and monetary response to the sad. crisis. That is not the case today. Okay. Uh, the Fed is talking about, of, about getting back to normal from a situation of what mm -hmm. they call unconventional monetary policy, which is no okay. further room for expansion. Okay. If a crisis were to hit, all they can do is stay where they are. They cannot think in terms of uh, okay. moving dramatically, you know, to do anything in, to, to this one. So I think the capacity of the global economy to respond to crisis is Limited. much less. Okay. And so if a shock were to hit, its impact would be that much greater. So on that very rather bleak note, so we will take a break, but we'll be back very soon. Please stay with us. Welcome back. To call it an anti-climax would be a bit of an understatement. 
After all the sound and fury about government finally allowing FDI, that is foreign direct investment, in multi-brand retail, it looks like the biggest of them all, Bentonville-based Walmart, is walking away from its joint venture from its Indian partner, Bharati. Both partners have decided to pursue their retail businesses independently. Under the existing law, Walmart can only enter the wholesale cash and carry business if it doesn't have an Indian partner, since FDI rules limit overseas investment to 51%. But the retail giant seems to prefer that to its traditional multi-brand retail business model. Is this a consequence of our onerous FDI rules, in which case it might have repercussions for our hopes of attracting large volumes of FDI? Or is it merely an isolated case of two business partners falling out? We'll get Subir in on that, but first, our Bureau report. The world's largest retailer is separating from its Indian partner. The separation will leave her Kansas-based Walmart with the 50% stake of Bharti Walmart Private Limited, which means complete control over 20 wholesale stores under the best price modern wholesale brand, the wholesale venture and its supply chain. Bharti in turn will get a substantial amount of cash to strengthen its retail operations. Under Indian FDI rules, if Walmart wants to set up its own retail stores in India, it will have to find another local partner to own 49% of the business. Walmart tied up with Bharti in 2007 in a 50-50 joint venture. Bharti Walmart Private Limited to do wholesale cash and carry and back-end supply chain operations. But its growth failed to live up to takeoff. Walmart has not opened a wholesale or cash and carry store in India for about a year, despite earlier plans to open eight in 2013. Analysts say that focusing on the wholesale business will enable Walmart to build up its supply chain to support future retail stores. For Bharti, the breakup means losing a deep-pocketed partner to support its retail expansion. Bharti operates the 212-store Easy Day chain and says it will continue to invest in and grow the business. Whatever the reason for parting, what will be worrying for the government is that no company has yet applied to enter India under its new FDI rules that were eased since last year. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. So, it is not the first joint venture between Indians and foreigners to fall apart. After all, argumentative Indians presumably also translate into argumentative corporates. But this is more worrisome because so many hopes were pinned on to FDI and retail. So, should we look at it as just an isolated instance of two partners falling out? Or does it have repercussions which are linked to the FDI policy? I think we have to fundamentally uh, re-examine the whole premise of uh, organized retail and mm -hmm. its viability in this economy. Mm -hmm. Uh, my sense is, uh, I have not studied this in great depth, but I've been observing the evolution of our domestic chains uh, in the way that they've grown and in many cases uh, failed. And to me, the, the big struggle, I think, uh, in terms of the sort of global model of, of uh, you know, retail chains uh, is that the costs of uh, real estate in India are extremely high. And if you want to get the kind of density or the footfalls mm -hmm. that you need to keep a store viable, mm -hmm. uh, you have to locate it in a place where uh, the rents make it uh, prohibitive and therefore you know, quite uh, difficult to, to break even. So for a chain to expand and to grow to the size where all of these economies of scale at the back end, the supply chain, the house brands, all of those things that make for a successful mm -hmm. retail model, uh, the, the costs to build up to that are so high that I think most chains are finding it very, very difficult to sustain that momentum. So for Walmart, Bharati, uh, it comes down to a judgment on, or for, for any joint venture, it comes down to a judgment on, you know, can you build up to a national uh, chain which gives you all the economies at the back end without sort of completely undermining your, uh, the, the economics so of each store. So it's not the store. FDI rules per se, it's uh, the no, business there is, there itself. Is that. There is an okay. element to that. Uh, the FDI rules, mm -hmm. because it leaves, they leave each state the discretion of allowing uh, yeah. foreign investment, right. does not allow for any chain to plan a national strategy. Okay. So for a foreign investor to come in and say, look, I'm going to put up, I need to put up at least a thousand stores or okay. 1500 stores to make sense mm -hmm. of my model. Uh, and I have to negotiate with you know, every state individually. Mm -hmm. So I don't know when it's going to roll out. I don't know whether I can get into the states that I think are, are uh, promising, mm -hmm. uh, it breaks the model down. So I think we've got to look at uh, the national market okay. uh, and a common set of rules mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to provide a sort of basis for anybody to start thinking about that. And real estate is, in any case, a constraint because in, in all the large cities, 
uh, rentals are phenomenally high. You cannot afford to set up large uh, capacity stores with the kind of, of rentals. Of course, we really don't have a national market given our tax structure, which is what we're hoping yes, to change yes, with GST. Yes, absolutely. But apart from that, there were some concerns, I think, that Walmart had about the sourcing requirement, the 30% the sourcing that you had to do with locally and from small businesses, etc. Is that a major constraint? And is that why maybe nobody's really come in? I think that that is a constraint, but uh, I think that's something that uh, most, if you have volumes mm -hmm. and you can uh, invest in supply chain uh, mm -hmm. creation and management, uh, it won't be a permanent okay. bottleneck. I think it's where the trade-off or where the, uh, the dilemma is that if, you, if you're not uh, uh, confident of generating the volumes, then developing a supply chain is a risk. Okay. You don't want to do that. Now, if you already got an established global supply chain, okay. why would you want to deviate from that and set something up true, new true. when you don't have a guarantee that uh, you can open up the stores to justify it? So the linkage between a supply chain and mm. the front end, mm. uh, the number of stores, mm. the size of each store, the average mm. size of each store, mm. this is all a part of the same business okay. plan. And we are not sort of allowing, I think, okay. that business plan to... Uh, to gel. So this is where I see the problem with the policy. So uh, is it policy uncertainty or is it political uncertainty that's really deterring people from coming in at the moment? I, I think it's it's in the in the immediate instance it is the policy because okay. you you really don't you you've not allowed a national strategy to emerge. Okay. No no retail chain can have a national a foreign any with the foreign investment can have a national strategy because each state has a discretion to say I will allow foreign investment or I will not allow foreign investment. So if I have to look at five states or six states as a potential market, it's not worth my while. Except that this is a, has major chain. repercussions for the FDI versus FII debate because we want FDI, whereas what we're getting is FII. So do you see this as increasing our dependence on you know, portfolio investment, trickle investment? Yes, absolutely. I think I think organized retail has uh, the opportunity to do many things. Uh, okay. but I'm, I, I think the development of a domestic supply chain is going to be a very important positive outcome okay. from expanding organized retail. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can only happen if the, re the retailer has the confidence of national access. Okay. And I think so you've got to look at the logical consistency between the different components of the policy. You're restricting access on the one hand and you're forcing a supply chain on the other. Those That's two true. don't go together. So absolutely. It's, so it's going to be pretty tough for any investor to come in on I think so. Ones, so I think, and I think the, the, uh, the logic of the policy okay. has to be re-examined. It, it needs the to be much more to be logical. But on that note, so we will take a slip into a very short break, but we'll be back very soon. So please stay with us. Welcome back. Janet Yellen's appointment as the head of the U.S. Federal Reserve may have hogged the headlines as marking the collapse or the last bastion of male dominance at the head of the head. But what matters to us in India is how she plans to go about unwinding the Fed's unorthodox policy of buying 85 billion worth of bonds every month to keep interest rates artificially low. Given the U.S. dollar's position as the international reserve currency, any tapering in its bond buying, even talk of its tapering, it's enough to set markets on edge. We saw what happened during the May-August period when the mere mention of tapering by the present chairman, Bernanke, saw the rupee fall precipitously. As a former DG of the RBI, who better than Subhi to tell us what tapering could mean for us? But first, let's hear this bureau report. She is a proven leader. The first woman at the helm of the U.S. Federal Reserve is not the only change economists are bracing for. They are also expecting to see the tapering of the U.S. fiscal stimulus pushed back further. 67-year-old Janet Yellen has emerged as the U.S. President's choice to succeed Ben Bernanke, the central bank's current chairman, whose term ends in January 2014. Obama nominated Yellen as the Fed's vice chairwoman in 2010, but she was not his first choice for the Fed's top post. Till last month, Obama was seen to be backing former advisor Lawrence H. Summers for the job. But that changed when Democratic senators opposed Summers, forcing him to opt out. The focus is on Yellen now. She's considered a supporter of active government intervention to help the economy. Which is why the question being asked is how soon will she start winding down the expansionary monetary policy of Bernanke? Economists had expected the tapering of the stimulus to start this month. But given that Yellen has been one of the most vocal advocates of the artificial stimulus, they are pushing back their expectations to as late as March. 
Yellen was previously president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, a White House advisor, and also a Fed governor during the Clinton administration. She is married to Nobel Prize winning economist George Ekeloff. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Well, Subir, we've got a woman at the Federal Reserve in the US. We've got a woman heading the largest bank in India and State Bank of India. But how do you see her appointment? What does it mean for us, really? She said she's reported to be very dovish. So do you see her continuing this, you know, the Fed's policy of quantitative easing? And how long can we survive on steroids like this? Well, for one thing, she's not been appointed. Yeah. She's, uh, she's been nominated. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so Correct. she still has to go through But that's the, almost a given, isn't it? Uh, not necessarily, because the Senate uh, will have to confirm her. And the Senate, uh, you know, is, is always uh, a bit uncertain. Uh, from what I gathered, uh, while the Democratic senators on the Senate Finance Committee uh, yeah, opposed uh, Lord like Summers, her, yeah. uh, her dovishness mm. is uh, causing some concern mm. about the Republican mm. members of the committee, uh, you know, uh, opposing her nomination. But I, I, I think that's that's a relatively uh, Small issue, less yeah, likely yeah. outcome. Mm. I, let's assume that mm. she will get uh, confirmed. Uh, her dovishness is clearly her mm. most significant attribute at this point. Uh, she has always been identified amongst the mm. FOMC, the Federal Open Markets mm. Committee, as the one m strongly in favor of uh, continuing with mm. the unconventional monetary policy, the, the, the quantitative easing, uh, and to only roll it back, firstly, roll it, only begin to roll it back at a time when the economy looks fairly stable, and two, to do it at a pace which uh, minimizes disruption. Uh, if this is the case, uh, then the earliest we can expect things to start is after she takes over, I don't think there will be any action between now and then, which means uh, first quarter, yeah, after, yes, after the end of okay. January. And if it happens at that point, it will be done at a pace which I don't think will uh, will cause the kind of okay. disruption that we've seen. This, this disruption will cause an anticipation. But that was only talk, Subir, because even yes, that but, hadn't but happened. The talk, it was mere talk was uh, enough to The set talk that. Was, uh, did not give a clear sense of the okay. pace. Okay. Uh, so you know, people expected the worst. Now let's okay. keep in. Let's not forget the fact that global markets, mm -hmm. financial markets, mm -hmm. have are far removed from economic fundamentals now. Absolutely, they've been. You know, assets mm -hmm. are being priced at levels which mm -hmm. are completely inconsistent with what the uh, growth uh, momentum and so on on the ground are. And this is essentially the result of liquidity. So if if there's any threat that that liquidity is going to be withdrawn, there's an immediate repricing of assets. So how long can we live in this kind of very artificial world, as it were? Well, I think uh, again, it's it's uncha completely uncharted uh, territory. We just have no precedence for how this process plays out. But the idea is okay. uh, that uh, as the fundamentals start to become stronger, you okay. can sort of start to withdraw the liquidity okay. without causing too much disruption. I think that's what Janet Yellen's uh, okay. and and many you know, the more dovish okay. view is mm -hmm. that don't take it away suddenly. Okay. Uh, let's watch the data. Let's okay. watch the recovery happening and start to offset the impact of that recovery through a withdrawal of liquidity. But she's going to be looking at US data, whereas what we are concerned is we should use that breather very sensibly yes. to set our house in order. Absolutely. Will we do that? Well, that's, that's I think, a question that you should ask uh, your, your, the, people the government in government that you, government, you talk to. Uh, there's no question that we have a few months now in which to initiate. We, okay. we will not be able to solve the problem in a few months. Okay. But I think we need to articulate some very clear strategies on how we're going to address oh. the current account deficit, how we're going to address the fiscal deficit, because so, these are the, our okay. points of vulnerability. And when the taper comes, if we are okay. a little better prepared than we were last time, I think the shock okay. will be much less. So we've less. got to use a sen breather sensibly, wisely. Only yes. then can we hope to Absolutely. do better. Uh, thank you very much, Subir, for being with us for this program. A look at the key takeaways from today's program. Well, as far as the mixed data is concerned, Subir really is concerned about the fact that the WEO, the IMF's WEO does you know, sharply lower down the projections for India's road this year. But that is, seems to be the consensus estimate. So there's not very much good news on that front. As far as the Bharti Walmart thing is concerned, the joint venture is concerned, the breakup, the fact that we don't have a national market is a big minus as far as FDI and retail is concerned because they're looking at volumes. And that cannot happen in the absence of a national market. As far as Janet Yellen's appointment is concerned, what matters to us most of all is that she's most probably going to do the tapering in a very slow, gradual fashion. As long as they use the intervening months to set our house in order, things should definitely be better. On that note, we come to the end of this program. Thank you so much for being with us. But we'll be back next week, same time. So do stay with us.